What has happened, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back to review the new movie, The Trip to Greece, which comes out on demand on Friday. This is the fourth installment in the series directed by Michael Winterbottom, starring Steve Coogan and Rob Brydon. Now, in the UK, this has been released as four seasons of television, but here in the US, they've been edited down into four feature films. Now, I should admit from the outset that I am biased because The Trip from 2010 is one of my favorite comedies of the last decade. I saw it twice in the theater, and I've seen it many times since, in particular certain scenes on YouTube, which I can just watch on a loop over and over again, and I howl like a goddamn crazy person each and every single time. That first movie just had the perfect combination of light entertainment, food porn, intense discussions about culture, history, etc. And then at times that first movie would become strangely melancholy and moving with all these interesting scenes about growing old and the artistic ambitions of both Coogan and Bryden and the differences between being a serious actor or a light entertainer. But as much as I love that first movie, I will totally concede that a trip to Italy and a trip to Spain were not nearly as good. I had an absolute blast watching those movies, and I'll always show up to watch Steve Coogan and Rye Bryden doing their thing. But regrettably, I must report that the trip to Greece is right along the same lines as the trip to Italy and the trip to Spain. It seriously falls short of that dynamic first film. This time around, not only are they taking a trip through Greece, but they're tracing the journey of Odysseus from where he set sail at the end of the Trojan War, and they do their best to approximate his 10-year journey back to Ithaca. And much like Odysseus's journey in the Odyssey, where it took him 10 years to get home, this movie marks the end of a 10-year journey because it appears as if for now, after 10 years of making these movies, they're ready to hang it up. What was fun for me is that I'm actually listening to the audiobook of the Odyssey right now, the Robert Fagel's translation read by Ian McKellen. And Ian McKellen, he just brings all that Shakespearean gravitas to it. It makes the Odyssey as exciting and dramatic and impactful as like watching The Lord of the Rings. But what's cool is that in this movie, they visit a lot of the physical locations that I'm hearing Ian McKellen bring to life in that audiobook. And the reason I'm doing the deep dive on the Odyssey right now is because of a future live stream on this channel, but that is neither here nor there. But when it comes to the trip to Greece, I'll argue that for fans of the series, it's required viewing. And obviously, if you're a fan of the previous three movies, since you're probably not sitting around waiting for reviews on the trip to Greece, you've probably already rented it or bought it in advance. But I don't think I'm being unnecessarily cruel or harsh by trying to be objective and acknowledging that none of the three sequels can hold a candle to that original film. This movie gives us more of what we already know and love, but nothing really new which Coogan and Bryden are the first to acknowledge in one lengthy conversation about how, as an artist or a storyteller, if you live to a certain age, it's inevitable that you start to repeat yourself, which opens up a fun conversation about whether or not any art is actually original or is it all derivative of something else. Because when it comes to architecture and philosophy and theater and mythology and just the art of storytelling, it's very hard to do anything new that the Greeks had not already done like two, 3,000 years ago. But what I enjoy about all four of these is how we're not actually watching a documentary. It's a faux documentary. Steve Coogan and Rob Bryden, they're basically playing approximations or extreme versions of themselves. In this movie, Steve Coogan's still really insecure about his work as a serious artist, and he wants more recognition as a dramatic actor. He's constantly referring to all of his BAFTA nominations and takes each and every opportunity that he can to deride or tease Bryden or dismiss him as a mere entertainer. And of course, they compete every step of the way throughout the movie, whether they're singing songs in the car, doing impersonations at the dinner table, or discussing their knowledge of ancient Greece, or even physically with this epic swimming contest they indulge in. But they have that classic, the man you love to hate dynamic, where they love and adore each other. However, they take intense pleasure in watching the other one squirm or be embarrassed, etc. But even when these movies disappoint, I still find plenty to enjoy. There's this one great conversation where they're discussing how to measure the success of a book. Are we talking about total sales or longevity or influence? And Steve Coogan's hypocrisy on multiple fronts never fails to delight me because while he claims that he doesn't measure a book's greatness by sales, Bryden is very quick to point out that Coogan's constantly bragging about the stats of his various shows. And I feel like that's been one of the best ongoing themes throughout all four of the movies. And this movie calls attention to Coogan's hypocrisies again and again. He puts on a big show about claiming to be concerned with the plight of refugees living in a camp in Greece, yet he really struggles to remember the name of an actor that he worked for for months as they're driving him home to one of those camps. Or he'll sit around bragging about his electric car, and yet Bryden will point out once again that he has nine total, and that his big environmental gesture is somewhat hollow. But on the negative side, I would argue that when it comes to the food featured in these movies, the way the restaurants and food is depicted, it's getting a little stale, it's getting a little boring. The cutaways to the kitchens no longer really do anything for me. But I have to admit, I still really enjoy their style of food criticism. They're eating at some of the nicest restaurants in Greece, but when it comes to reviewing a particular dish, they'll typically give one or two words at most. It's a strange mix of snobbery in terms of what they're eating, but also anti-snobbery in terms of their reactions. And that contrast of highbrow and lowbrow is an ongoing joke throughout the movie. And probably the funniest scene in all the movie, one that absolutely had me howling, is when Rob 
Rob Brydon just out of nowhere starts singing the theme song to the movie Grease while they're driving through Greece. And of course, Coogan delights in pointing out that Brydon's a little bit too preoccupied with the lower forms of entertainment when they're surrounded by all this ancient culture. But I absolutely love those kinds of juxtapositions because both with this channel as well as with my podcast, I'm always trying to eradicate this arbitrary imaginary line between high culture and low culture. And for the hardcore fans of the movies that know the last three movies well, they will enjoy the fact that there's a lot of variations on familiar jokes from the previous three movies where they kind of tweak or give a new spin on what worked in the past. On the other hand, that also leads to some serious science fatigue in this movie, in particular during some of the scenes where they're acting out scenes from their favorite movies. My favorite scene by far in all four of the movies is in the first one when they're recreating the scene between Christopher Lee and Roger Moore and the man with the golden gun. I have no idea how many times I've watched it, but it's a lot. But here in The Trip to Greece, they have scenes where they're doing Duel and Marlon Brando's, or they're recreating scenes with Dustin Hoffman and John Voight from Midnight Cowboy, or they're recreating scenes from Tootsie, and the scenes just ring so hollow, and they're so criminally unfunny, and I'm someone who's seen all these movies many times. I run a podcast, Wrong Real, about film history. As someone who spends as many hours per week as I do watching old movies, is kind of exasperated by these scenes, then something's going horribly wrong. The only time where their competing impersonations really shines this movie is when they get together with Emma and the photographer that Coogan's had an on-again, off-again romance throughout the four films. But when they've got an audience seated there at the table, Bryden and Coogan really shine, doing their dueling Mick Jagger impressions. But another area where this movie starts to feel a little stale is when we get so many familiar beats that come from the earlier movies, like Coogan talking to his manager and getting shot down for movie parts that he wants, or conversations on the phone with his son, who I've always felt like is one of the weakest characters in this franchise, except for in the first movie. But the movie does have some interesting meditations on age. There's a really funny scene where they're gazing upon three women in Greece and talking about the three sirens that tried to lure Odysseus and his crew to their doom when Odysseus famously had himself lashed to the mast so that he could hear the sirens but was unable to answer their call. And Bride makes some funny jokes about how Coogan's such a womanizer that perhaps he needs to be strapped to the mast like Odysseus. And I do enjoy these self-reflective scenes where both Bryden and Coogan are thinking about where their careers are, where their careers might be headed. As performers and artists, what are they trying to achieve with their lives? And I think this movie manages to stick the landing with some particularly moving scenes. Not as sad and haunting as in the first film, but it does go out on a high note. So even if I think the movie was uneven or inconsistent or not nearly as strong as the first, they can still hold their heads high that they found a very satisfactory conclusion to this four movie saga. So as I mentioned before, if you love the three movies, you're obviously going to love The Trip to Greece. I don't know how I would rank them apart from the fact that the trip's up here and the other three are down here, and that's totally fine. I still enjoy the franchise overall. Steve Coogan and Rob Brydon have given me a lot of laughs over the years, and at a time where comedy and film seems deader than ever, I feel like if you look at the comedy genre historically, I don't know if there's ever been a weaker time than right now. I still love stand-up, but when it comes to comedy movies, it's slim pickings. So the fact that they've been able to crank up these four movies for the last 10 years, that alone is an achievement. But like I said, I think The Trip is one of the best comedies of the last decade. It gets my strongest possible recommendation. But at this point, I think I'm starting to repeat myself, much like they discussed in this particular movie. So I'm going to wrap this up. But if you want to talk more about The Trip movies, you can hunt me down on Twitter at Colbrach. And if you enjoyed this review, please consider subscribing to the channel, hitting that notification bell. But I can't thank you enough for watching the video. I really appreciate it. But more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.